three panelists. Yes. A gentleman here on the in front, second row, front, this row. If you may state your where you're from and your question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ben Land. I'm a journalist for the Financial Times. Um, I just want to ask, over the next uh, year, what do you think the impact of high prices for other grains like corn and wheat is likely to be for rice? Because um, during the last food crisis, those other grains um, saw in value first, rice was the last to go. Do you think that may happen again um, at the moment, given soaring prices of grain and uh, other grains, basically? Good answer. I'm pretty sure that uh, you will have some, some, uh, some impact because other grain and particularly oil prices have moved up to eighty some dollars. Uh, but the the main thing is a QE from the United States and other wealthy nations that create all of these imbalances. When you print more money uh, with the QE uh, system. The spillover of liquidity will come to other developing nations. And all of this means you will have high oil prices, you will have high rye prices, high real estate prices. Theoretically, that's the way it is. And I'm pretty sure that this could create high prices for rice because of the QE, which normally we do not relate. Most of the rice trade people don't understand what QE is. But today, to stay in business, you have to understand what QE is and what QE is doing to your right business. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next. Any other questions? Third row. Chen uh, Pong from the Yuanlong Ping Agriculture High Tech Company. I have a question for Dr. Uh, Mopati. Uh, if I understand you correctly from your presentation, you are projecting the retail rice price in China will decrease by 60%, something like that, in by 2035. Um, can you help me understand some of the key assumptions you use behind this conclusion? I understand you have two key assumptions. One is the, uh, the consumption of rice will decrease with rising income. The other one is the, uh, the yield will continue to improve. My question is, is, it, is there any other key consumptions you use? Uh, I think uh, you misunderstood the, the, the graph I had. Uh, I was looking at uh, some assumptions regarding Eri Rice research. Eri Rice research is geared up towards improving the productivity. We're assuming if Eri Rice research contributes 15 kg of paddy a year, in all Asian countries, a simple assumption. And over the next 25 years, if that continues, by 2035, what will be the impact on retail prices with any research but without any research? I'm not talking about the labels. The label of rice prices might be much higher. I don't know. But what I'm saying is, if any contributes 15 kg every year, any rice research, to the yield of Asian rice economy, yield, by 2035, the the Chinese retail prices would be 15, 16 percent lower than what would have happened without any rice research. So it is mostly talking about the impact of the research on yield and the prices and the poverty and the acreage and the environmental impact. So you consider the Yes, we have, in the baseline, we have assumed the acreage is going down in China, the per capita consumption is going down. So the, the, the rice retail prices in the baseline level, I don't remember, but it's probably not increasing that much in, in China. But the 16% the, the I showed, just the impact of rice research on, on, on prices and poverty and, uh, and, uh, and acreage. Near the cameraman, I'll come back to you shortly. Good afternoon, uh, my name is Marco Bobonais, I'm from the Africa Rice Center. I'd like to congratulate all speakers for a very interesting presentation. I had a comment on a graph shown by Sam Moranti, where you show petty yields in Asia and Africa. I think you should be aware that you can't really compare those situations because
because in Africa most rice is grown under upland conditions, green fat, and uh, in, Af in Asia it's like 60% irrigated. Now, if you would compare an irrigated crop in Africa, for example in the Sahel, in Mali, or Senegal, with an irrigated crop in Thailand, I think the average would be even higher than in Thailand. We're talking about six tons per hectare in Senegal and Mali right now, and uh, the country is much higher because of high soil radiation, good soils, and irrigation. So we have to be careful if you compare uh, apples and apples. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I don't think I meant to compare Asia and Africa. What I was telling is the variation within Asia and variation within Africa. There is a, there is a gap there which can be closed. Uh, thank you, also to your panelists. Um, my name is Mark Hillhoff, I'm from South Africa, and I'm, uh, I'm here really as an emerging investor in the rice industry in Africa. Um, my question relates uh, more to, to the, our, our colleague from Thailand, who made a statement saying that uh, Thailand's future in terms of remaining as the major exporter is probably going to diminish over the next um, um, two or three decades. <coughs> Uh, from, from, uh, from him and from our panelists, maybe some indication of what role Africa would begin to play in terms of meeting not only its own demand, but also becoming a major um, role player in terms of supplying uh, Asia and Southeast Asia in particular in the future. Yeah, you want to take one? Let Eric have one answer? Or... Well, you know, uh, you know, what he said is uh, Probably too in, Africa, in Thailand, the, the, the dominance <coughs> might decline over time. But you need to go back and look at what Prabhu who was here before that, uh, uh, what he said about, said about Africa uh, in, in terms of uh, African rice needs and uh, what will happen if Africa not producing anything. I, I, I agree with that. If Africa not producing anything, I don't think Asian countries have the ability to completely feed the African population. And I made a comment in my presentation that. African production growth has accelerated in the last 8 to 10 years, quite a bit. You can see that their import is kind of stagnant. And I, I, I really believe that somewhere behind the line when Asians, all the Asian countries are subsidizing the rice production, and that has impact in terms of what has happened in African production growth. And we see that the last 8 to 10 years when the, when the rice prices increased, we see that African farmers responding to that and producing rice uh, based on what the, what the market price is. Uh, so, for me, uh, African can def definitely play a role. If, uh, also, I would like to point out one more thing I have been telling all over that if we really want to stabilize the rice market, we need to have rice exporters beyond Asia, where rice is not a stable commodity. Just like corn or soybean, we have, we have countries who are producing for the sake of exports. So that you know that this particular country is producing and they will respond to the market signal. If the price goes up, they will release stock. The stock will reach the global market. If we want any sort of stabilization in the global market, rice needs to be produced in many African countries who will be producing for the sake of exports and rice needs to be produced in many South American countries who will be producing for the sake of exports. I don't think just producing and exporting by Asian country is going to keep the market stable in the future. Uh, you remember I said that high farmers have high margin but poor because they don't have enough land. Why not to invite them to go to Africa? You know, they would be so happy because then the economy of scale would be there. The land is plenty in Africa, water is plenty. And it would do wonderful things for the farmer themselves and also the Thai government would feel relieved and you will benefit if a win-win situation. <laughs>
plant it uh, some other crop instead. And also, I think uh, the uh, because the uh, dynamics uh, adjustment of the market, I, I think the, the reality price of the other crop is is coming to stronger than to to induce farmer to to still keeping uh, the 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 area to grow rice. Yet in Thailand right now, I think the the, the, the number of farmer declining and also the uh, planting area declining. Thanks, it's uh, Tom Schuller with Bear Crop Science in the USA. My, uh, uh, first of all, I, I, uh, I do believe that uh, we do need in agriculture to take a very close look at the uh, linkage between, uh, between fuel prices and uh, commodity prices and how that trends. That's something that, that, that I look at when I think about what's happening with commodity prices. Um, uh, and, and I also wanted to ask you just a question about uh, uh, quantitative easing. Do you feel, is your comment on quantitative easing based on uh, the hedge fund relationship we saw back in 2008 where the hedge fund positions were tied on pools of commodities and as oil prices ran up, they had to balance their hedge funds to uh, bring more, more agricultural commodities into hedge funds and that's what drove commodity prices? Can I handle this one? Very interesting one. Definitely not QE then, 07 or 08. It's politics. Now, you remember that India announced the closing of rice export sometime in 07. And then it followed by China, followed by Vietnam. Now this is on the supply side. And Egypt also, and there are other countries, I don't remember all. But then on the, on the importing side, Philippines, on the blue sky, would pay any price above the market. You see, you've got two, two uh, uh, seller and buyer. Seller say, I don't want to sell, I close my door. And buyer say, ah, tell me whatever you, Vietnam, sell to me, any amount, any price. You see, you've got this unusual thing going on, all decision made by politician. That's why right prices went up in 07, 08. Now, the quantity, the supply of rice was not in shortage. It was normal. Everything was normal in 07, 08. What was abnormal is this polit politician decision, both in exporter country and importer country. Now, how did India react to that? <coughs> because of wheat, because of corn, because of oil prices. All of those seem to be inching up a lot. But no matter what, they did not go in terms of 300%, three times. Rye prices went from 300 to 1,000. Now, wheat price probably went up maybe 60-70% or so, corn more or less in the same range. It does not exceed in terms of many times. Whenever any commodity went up in prices in four or five months, three, three <laughs> times higher, it's absolutely nonsense. It's something wrong. And that's what happened in 07 or 08. It has nothing to do with QE, then probably then there was no QE. Yeah. <coughs> But I thought, I thought uh, normally if you look at the commodity index fund, rice is not one of the commodities included in the index fund. Am I wrong? I thought most of the index funds, uh, except very small ones, have rice, uh, very small share. <coughs> so, so when, when the 2007-8, was the rice was impacted by the by the speculative uh, behavior by the financial sector? Eric, let me let me respond a, a bit to that. Uh, I think that there was some of that, and there's in fact, I think, some of the speculative in hedge funds uh, going into the rice futures currently, which is, is what, what's pushing that uh, relative, let's say, to the uh, cash rough price price in, in the U.S. We're seeing a huge margin, actually, uh, there developing. Uh, but on the other hand, I, I think, okay, yes, the dollar is going to depreciate. We, we, we know that, uh, and that's going to push some pressure here on, on all commodity prices. But I think that, uh, again, if you look at the market fundamentals this year, we have record world production. We have uh, increases or at least flat, flat level here in terms of stocks. So I think it, it's important that this story be reported as saying that, yes, there's going to be some push uh, from the depreciation of the dollar with the, the QE2. 
Um, but the, the market fundamentals do not um, augur for the kind of price spike that we see.